Well, we are in Revelation chapter 1, and uh, I'd like to begin reading at, uh, at verse 9 and reading down to verse 18. It says, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you See and send it then to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all of its brilliance. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. And then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now, look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the key of death and Hades. Well, I don't know if you've thought about this, but have you ever wondered what Jesus looks like? I mean, it's a curious thing that none of the gospel writers describe what Jesus looked like in terms of his his physical traits. Was he tall? Was he short? Did he have excess weight? Was he skinny? What about his facial features? Uh, Did he have facial hair? I think we assume that he did. Uh, Did he have long hair? We actually find no clues in the Gospels. And so over the centuries, artists have offered their depictions that represent what they think Jesus looks like. The oldest known portrait of Jesus was found in Syria, and it's actually dated around 325 AD. You know, if you grew up in Sunday school, Uh, like I did, you've likely seen the more famous depictions. Uh, I remember in my growing up years, I related to a famous picture of Jesus, and it's the one that has him posing, kind of looking off to the side, flowing hair, and this well-kept beard. And then in the 1970s, of course, the era of the Jesus people, there was a new picture that became famous, and it was the picture of a, a smiling Middle Eastern man with curly hair and a round face. But in the end, we don't have an accurate description of what Jesus looked like physically. And today as we come to this passage in Revelation, we actually have the only biblical description of Jesus. John, of course, knew what Jesus would have looked like in his earthly ministry. I mean, he'd spent three years with him. But what John sees is a revelation of Jesus. This revelation is not designed to describe Jesus' physical traits so much as it's designed to show us who Jesus is. Last week in in the introduction to the book of Revelation, we noted that the word revelation is the translation of the word that means unveiling or laid bare. it's, It's pulling back the curtain to see. And this book, the book of Revelation, pulls back the curtain to see into the unseen realm. And yes, we're going to see what is to come, and we're going to see the Antichrist, and we're going to see the death and the destruction that's described. But first and foremost, this is a revelation of Jesus. This is a revelation from Jesus. It's a revelation of Jesus. This book is written to Christians living and, 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 and surviving through persecution. So here they were, they were marginalized, they were, you know, sent to the edges of society, some of them were tortured, some had witnessed their fellow believers killed for their faith. And what they needed was a message of hope and a message of courage. What they needed was to know that evil rulers, energized by dark powers, did not have ultimate authority, did not have the final say. They needed to know that the God in whom they trusted was going to win the day. They needed a fresh vision of Jesus who conquered death, hell, and the grave. They needed a fresh reminder of who wins in the end. And as the storm clouds were getting darker, they needed courage to face what was coming. And so through this vision, John gives them a view, a vision, a revelation of the risen, conquering Jesus. 
And so in verse 8, he's the Alpha and the Omega, the God who who, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And, and last week, we looked at that title of Jesus. So, of course, we're not going to go over it again today. But there are many things in the book of Revelation that they're, they're difficult to understand. And, and people have debated and opined on so many things. You know, the identity of the Antichrist, the meaning of 666, the timing and the nature of the millennial reign of Christ, and so many other things that we could talk about. It lets us know that there are mysteries that one day we will understand, and there are pictures and images that we we really can't make full sense of right now. But this book is not primarily a revelation of all things. It's a revelation of one thing, actually one person, and that's Jesus. John describes what he saw and heard, not so that we will dissect every detail, but so that we will see Jesus and experience the wonder of who he is and the wonder of what he will do. So we're going to look at this portrait of Jesus. In the scripture I read, I I began with the verse that we left off on, and it's verse 9, and and it's John just introducing himself. He says, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Now, at first glance, John's introduction of himself as the author and what he describes there doesn't seem like very good advertising for Christianity. Listen, if you, wanted, if you went, to a, uh, went to a marketing company and, and you said, you know, I want to sell faith in Jesus, they'd, of course, get you to highlight the positives, you know, that you can experience forgiveness and a clean conscience and have eternal hope and eternal life and inner peace and this amazing family to belong to. And, you know, there's lots of benefits. John introduces himself as a companion in suffering and patient endurance. I mean, he's on the island of Patmos because he lived as a faithful follower of Jesus. Following Jesus has not made his life easier. It's actually brought hardship. So let's just get it out there. Yes, following Jesus is amazing. I mean, when Jesus spoke of himself as the way, the truth, and the life, it means that there is really no other way to live. In and through him, we know God. In and through him, we find purpose. It's it's him, in him is eternal life. And that's eternal life is not not only eternal in the fact that it goes on forever, but eternal in its quality, in its magnitude right now in this life. But I think the message here is that followers of Jesus are not exempt from challenges, certainly not exempt from hardships, not exempt from being misunderstood. And John lets us know that being faithful to Jesus was resulting in the very thing that Jesus had talked to his disciples about. You know, just before Easter, when we looked at Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17, he was was praying for his disciples. And he states simply that, He gave them God's word, and what happened was the world hated them for it. And Jesus goes on to pray that the Father would not take them out of the world, but they would be protected from the evil one. God didn't take John out of the challenges and the persecutions and the hardships. He's on Patmos. Uh, you know, a few years ago, a group of our, from our church, we visited Patmos, and we stood in the cave that is said to be the place where John wrote this exact letter. And, of course, today it's a tourist destination because of this book. But in John's day, it was a small rocky island. It's about six miles long, uh, rather ten miles long, about six miles across. And in John's day, it was a place of isolation. It was a place of limitation. It was a place where people were sent because they were seen as troublemakers, disturbers. I mean, think of all of the things that Patmos was designed for. It was designed as a place of despair. It was designed as a place of hopelessness, a place where joy was unlikely, a place where you would be made to feel powerless and helpless and hopeless. Patmos is a place that you are sent to, never a place that you would choose to go to voluntarily. And here's the reality, friends. You and I may be in settings and in situations that we wouldn't choose, but here we are, we're there. Maybe it's a difficult job situation. Maybe it's a challenging family setting. Maybe it's health issues that seem to derail life and on and on to so many of the realities of our lives. And so not 
to in any way minimize the challenges that John faced on Patmos, but just to say that you may be on your own personal island of Patmos. And so John writes to the seven churches in Asia Minor, all of them identified by a geographic location, a city in Asia Minor. But for these Christians, they are, all of those places were actually their own version of Patmos. And friends, you know if you let it, Patmos can crush your spirit. Patmos has the potential to drive you away from God. But as we read this book, we realize that that didn't happen to John. In fact, the opposite happened. And it's this wonderful and powerful irony that some of the most powerful and comforting descriptions of heaven are recorded while John is in a setting that seems so unlike heaven. Some of the most glorious declarations about the power and the wonder of who God is it's written in a setting where it seemed like the evil one was winning the day. Some of the most graphic descriptions of Satan's defeat are revealed in a place and time when it probably felt so much like Satan was in charge. John is about to see a powerful vision of Jesus, but what he records just prior to that vision, I think is so helpful in seeing where John's state of mind was, where his heart was at. Look at verse 10. He says this, on the Lord's day, I was in the spirit. So let me just break that down in, in, for, for these few moments. What do you mean? What, what is the Lord's day? That, that term actually, Bible scholars note that it's the only time that there is a reference in the scriptures to the Lord's day. Now, the phrase, the day of the Lord, that one's used frequently, and it's generally a reference to the final day of judgment. It's the, it's the day of the wrapping up of human history. So what is the Lord's Day? Well, we don't know specifically, but we can assume that John's original audience was actually familiar with the expression. Now, had it have been a Saturday, as a Jew, John would likely have used the word Sabbath rather than the Lord's Day. We think it's probably Sunday, the first day of the week. That was the day that Christ rose from the dead. And you actually see the references to Christians gathering together on the first day of the week. It seems that followers of Jesus would gather during the week, often in homes, but then they would come together on the first day of the week on Sunday to celebrate the resurrection and to worship the living Jesus together. Is that what John was referring to? Well, we're not exactly sure, but John identifies that it's a day set aside for Jesus. I think we're at what is perhaps more significant is what he says next when he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. So don't miss this. John was physically on Patmos. We know that. But John was in the Spirit. That's interesting. That word Spirit is capitalized. So it's a reference to the Holy Spirit. John was in the Spirit. That is that he was immersed in, he was attuned to the Holy Spirit. And that transformed Patmos for John into a glorious place. You know, John could easily have been attuned to his bleak surroundings. He could have been attuned to his pain and to his failing body at an advanced age. He could have focused on negative emotions and feelings that inevitably come in difficult circumstances. But John chose to be in the Spirit. And I say chose because it is a choice. And so the question is, what does that choice look like? And I think it's actually very simply that John became very aware of and tuned into the Holy Spirit. He chose to turn his heart and his mind to hear what the Holy Spirit would say to him. So here he is physically on Patmos. Physically, he's in a very difficult place, but his spirit was not confined to the difficult circumstance. And so you say, John, how can you do that? Well, you know, it's easy to be in the spirit when you're having a good day, when you're listening to your favorite worship music, when you're surrounded by some of your favorite supportive people. But how you get in the spirit when you're on the rocky, barren island of Patmos? I, I believe, friends, it comes down to a choice. It's the choice to lean into the Spirit. And that might look like different things to different people, but it's turning my heart and my mind to God and to intentionally tune into the Spirit. It's engaging my inner person, that spiritual dimension, with the Holy Spirit. And when John does that, he encounters Jesus. First, he hears his voice, 
And then he sees the seven golden lampstands. And standing among those lampstands is the one who is speaking to him. Now, we know what the golden lampstands are. John tells us later in the chapter that the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And so next week, we're going to look at the seven churches as lampstands. Jesus is standing among them. And what we have is this incredible description of Jesus. And so here are the details. He has a white robe reaching down to his feet, and then he has a golden sash around his chest. His hair is white like wool, and it's, it goes on to even say white as snow. His eyes are like burning fire. His feet are like bronze glowing in a furnace. He has the voice like the sound of rushing waters. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp double-edged sword. His face shines like the sun. There's so much imagery here. Someone has calculated that of the 404 verses in the book of Revelation, 278 of those, those verses point back to the Old Testament, which is exactly the, the scriptures that would have been known to, to, to John and to, the, to, to those who were Jewish. This vision, this portrait of Jesus reflects some of those Old Testament references. And I don't want to dissect every image and try to guess at every meaning or possible significance. But I, I want to kind of get at some of the low-hanging fruit here. When it says that he was wearing a white robe and golden sash, the white robe was the basic uniform of the Old Testament priest. And in their role as priests, they provided access to God for the common people. Hebrews chapter 4 speaks of Jesus as our great high priest who has experienced our humanity. He, he understands us and he brings us with all of our weaknesses and all of our failures. As a priest, he brings us to God. The golden sash denotes his royalty, his authority. It's a, it's a symbol of strength for action. You know, John needed to know that Jesus is both priest and king. He is a mediator and he is a ruler. And then his white hair, what does that speak of? Well, it speaks of his wisdom. In Daniel chapter 7 in the Old Testament, God appears to Daniel as the ancient of days whose hair was white as wool. And as John sees the white hair, I think it's there to remind him that the one who rules our lives does so with perfect wisdom. And then he talks about eyes like burning fire. This is about the penetrating gaze of Jesus. This one who knows everything, he sees everything, nothing is hidden from him. He knows everything that happens to us and he responds with perfect wisdom. And then he, he describes how the feet were like bronze glowing in the furnace. And I wonder if this is in contrast to the story in the Old Testament of Daniel when there's a vision that Daniel has of a king and, and, and it's, it's a statue of this king and the, and the feet were iron and clay. And we know that iron and clay are, are brittle and they're going to crumble, but bronze is strong and durable. And I think the message here is that unlike human kings, Jesus won't crumble or collapse. And then it says he had the, the voice uh, like the rush of many rivers. Of course, his voice is powerful. In Genesis chapter 1, he speaks creation into being. And then there is this very strange, sharp uh, vision of sharp two-edged sword com coming out of his mouth. And Jesus slays his enemies by simply speaking a word. And as well, the word of Jesus is this powerful weapon that we're able to wield. And then his face like the sun in all of its brilliance. I think this speaks to his glory. The fullness of who he is radiates from him. And as John sees Jesus, it says that he falls down at Jesus' feet as if dead. And I would say, of course he does. I mean, Jesus in his infinite holiness and power and glory could have, could have crushed John, destroyed him. But Jesus does the opposite. John actually feels the hand of Jesus on him. For those who stand in opposition of Jesus, yes, they do need to fear. They will one day experience Jesus' burning eyes and burning feet and the double-edged sword that comes from his mouth. But for John, as he's on the island of Patmos, Jesus comes to him and lays his hand upon him and speaks word of, words of strength and comfort. And he says to him, he says, John, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. There it is again. He's the Alpha and the Omega. And then in verse 18, he says, I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death in Hades. John is on Patmos, but he's not, he's not alone. 
Jesus is there with him. John is at, on Patmos, and it looks like he's there at the hands of his persecutors, but he's not under their control. John is on Patmos, but the greater reality is that he's in the Spirit. And there he receives this fresh revelation of Jesus. And friends, that changes everything. You know, today, whatever you're experiencing, wherever you're at in your life, whatever challenges you're facing, can I just encourage you to, to look at Jesus? Look to the Jesus of Revelation chapter 1. Not the babe in the manger, not the man on the cross. But we're able to look to the risen, glorious King who is conqueror and is conquering. The Alpha, the Omega, the one who, who was from the beginning, who is Lord and God now, and who ultimately is bringing everything under his rule and authority. Would you join me as I pray? Jesus, we look at you today as we see this vision of who you are. Lord, this vision that was given to John on the island of Patmos in the place where hopelessness should have reigned, where helplessness would have been the order of the day. And Lord, you come to him and you show him yourself as the one who is the conquering king. And Father, for my friends who are, who've joined us today, Lord, would you in the midst of whatever they're going through, would you show yourself to them as the one who is absolutely in charge, as the one who is with them in the midst of the battle that they're in, who is the one who is with them as the God who is for them, not against them. And Lord, we embrace you as our king, and we are fully confident that you are bringing all things to fruition, all things to, to completion, and our lives are secure in your hands. And for that, we are grateful as we pray these things in Jesus' name. Well, thank you for joining us today. And listen, if you are in a place where you'd like to talk to a pastor or maybe connect with somebody from our church family, would you go to our website and simply hit the Start Here button? There's a Connect card there. You can fill that out and uh, online, and, and we'll get that, and, and that'll That'll be the opportunity for us to, to make a connection with you. There's also some other resources there, whether you're starting with your journey with Jesus, whether you're on the journey or advanced in your journey, uh, there's all kinds of resources there, so I commend that to you. And uh, at the close of our time together, uh, there's some reflection questions that are going to come up, and they're really there just designed to help you reflect on what you've uh, this passage that we've been in today. So thanks again for joining us. God bless you. Have a great week.